Um, so Tim and I are going to chat with you a bit about uh, you know, third-party testing, you know, why it's critical to understand how your technology behaves, and whether the selection that you're about to make will or won't suit the needs, right? You know, because candidly, right, security products are responsible for one thing in, in particular, right? That's generally to identify accurately threats uh, in the environment and to either you know, prevent them or record them to ensure that no particularly uh, egregious harm occurs. So, and I really, I think there's a few key things that we'll touch on here, and, and we do encourage, you know, questions if you have any, uh, make the session interactive. But, you know, the organization uh, you should set out when looking to pick a particular piece of technology to uh, ensure that the expectations and use cases are effectively set and that the um, organization understands exactly what they're looking for technology to do. As, as JJ noted on the last session, uh, the you know, uh, role of individual or, uh, components, right, you know, as a policy enforcement point or, or an element of mitigation, uh, they're, they're you know, often in line, but uh, wherever they're to be, uh, there's something that they're expected to do, right? That's why the allocation, the budget, and the, the resources will be applied. So building from those use cases, a test plan or methodology to accomplish that is critical and to understand what data goes into it as well as how it was achieved. Right? There's an awful lot of, uh, uh, let's say, interpretation uh, in regards to test data that can be uh, taken and that liberty or, or that, that uh, stretch uh, can, can lead one to make uh, poor choices or, or mislead you to make the wrong decision. At the end of the day, right, the key is that security should never be a guessing game. You need to know that the technology perform as it's deployed in the role that it's expected to before you go to production. Because I'll tell you what, finding out that your IPS, your NGFW, you know, whatever control you're talking about, doesn't suit the need, doesn't see threats, and has a very, uh, let's call it porous uh, surface, it is not a it's not a happy conversation with your boss after you threw you know two three four hundred thousand dollars and something to deploy it and protect your organization. So that's where it leads to effective third party tests. Great data saves you an enormous amount of time and potentially more than just time. Uh, you know it could also be the reason that you're not looking for another role the next you know the next quarter. So to the capabilities and expectations. This is so product selection is always unique to every environment. Your needs are not going to be the same as another needs. And make sure that the uh, the use cases, as well as how the the, uh, the test itself is is constructed, uh, reflects the traffic types or the user needs of your specific deployment. As I noted yesterday in the proof of concept discussion around uh, understanding, you know, again, what's in your environment, what the products are to be deployed as, and, and where they're to be deployed, all of this influences it. Because whether performance is key or whether the block mechanics are key, right, put the priority and, and understand where your organization places the greatest amount of uh, need so that that then informs the test and the, um, uh, the capability. So, yeah, it's, it's crucial that you also compare objectively. Right? It's not an emotional choice with respect to security technologies. It should be data-driven, and at the end of the day, it's got to be effective, right? So, so you know, efficacy, right? through box latency, you know, packet sizes, all these factors actually both influence the test construct, but also the performance of the device. And if, for example, it's a web uh, you know, traffic-specific appliance, then you're not going to need to worry as much about uh, super large packet sizes. You know, you're going to have an incredibly high transaction volume with small packets, which places a different load on a device that's placed in line. That actually will result in different behavior in the security efficacy validation and the testing uh, at the end of it. And so all of these factors influence the methodology or, or how the test is, is approached and executed. So really, when you're selecting a new technology or appliance, right, the use case and test scenarios, it must be executed and measured objectively in order for repeatability, right? Because inevitably, somebody's going to challenge your results, right? Somebody's going to come back and ask them, uh, are you sure? Are you certain it's the right choice? And what about this vendor? Or what about X? You know, inevitably, you'll have that, that question come up. Having the evidence, the data to support the uh, decision or to, to you know, reflect on whether something was missed is uh, crucial that there's an objective reference so that you can do so. Because you know you want to make sure that the organization is making the right choice and you're investing in a scale up because the wrong choice, well, 
you know, one outcome is that you spend a lot of money that's gone. Another is that there's something that is terrible makes a huge mess for the you know the incident guys and the gals to, to clean up. And obviously the le the last is that you know Brian Krebs publishes your logo on his site, which is never going to be a happy moment. And so that's the then the, the test plan and methodology. And, and this gets to that third party piece. So the most reputable third-party test houses are very articulate in how they create their test environments, what they're testing against, how they execute the tests, and oftentimes the test tools and versions, you know, they, they verbosely document uh, their, their execution in order to ensure that, that uh, any organization can interpret the data sets and do that comparative assessment. Because there's always corner cases where organizations ought to um, further that test set to uh, ensure that their needs specifically for the apps in use or for the user environment are tested because that's back to that unique elements that I mentioned earlier uh, you will, will potentially influence whether it's the right technology for you but you can knock down 90% of a proof of concept with a really great set of test results from a third-party test organization. So with that then uh, I'm going to turn over to Tim here who uh, has considerable experience, you know, in, in the construct of test as an architect, uh, and, and give you some colors to the why this third-party test material is so crucial. You know, how, how to kind of interpret the stuff. So, yeah. so, uh, okay. so uh, one of the things you see a lot is a uh, number on a screen, right? Like, um, I have a lot of numbers on the screen. <laughs> uh, they never really tell you what on a data sheet how they got there. Right, uh, and so uh, what Michael is leading to is, you know, things like large packet sizes, small packet sizes will reduce or, re or increase the number it looks like. Anybody building a test can make it look good. I can send really big packets with very little things that won't trigger any L7 inspection and you will go fast. But you'll never see that in a normal deployment. I mean, there are deployments, you know, if you're just between, you know, a bunch of backup servers, you might. You know, maybe that's your deployment and you're in segmentation, cool. But if you're on the edge, you're going to see encrypted traffic, you're going to see, you know, web traffic, you're going to see streaming, you're going to see all kinds of stuff, and you're not going to see these huge UDP packets that are, you know, referenced in, uh, in testing references like uh, RFC 2544. Those were really cool for switches back in the day. But, um, and routers back in the day. And if it's just a router, yeah, sure, go with that. But if it's an NGFW and you're looking for inspection, that's not the right answer anymore. You're not going to get a valid use case out of it. Um, one of the things that, you know, you have to watch out for is that. You also have to watch out for what they turn on and what they're using to validate them. So if we're, tra we're talking now nowadays, if you're talking about NGFW, you're talking about anything that inspects web, we're not actually talking about HTTP anymore. We're talking about TLS. And what TLS are we using? Are we using 1.3 with elliptical curve? Are we using 1.1? Those results will be drastically different. And as 1.3 and elliptical curve becomes more and more prevalent, the load on boxes is getting higher and higher to be able to decrypt if they can do it at all. So, you know, the normal answer for most people is TLS 1.3 gets downgraded to 1.2, and then we do something with it. But does it re get re-encrypted on the far end, back up to 1.3? Or is it just left at 1.2? Or is it not encrypted at all? These are all things you have to ask. So you need to know what your use case is and why you're trying to do these things and where we're going to deploy it so you can build a test it. You can build a test plan. Some third-party testings will actually do those things. They will validate that you decrypted. You decrypted correctly. You'll send attacks over TLS to make sure that this still blocks it. Because if all the bad guys are using TLS and you're not blocking the bad guys going over TLS, then you're missing something like 70 to 80% of your attack vectors and your clients are still decrypting because that's how the website gets loaded. So your users are still in trouble and you're gonna have a bad day. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out on here is, you know, if you look at gigabits and megabits and all that stuff, zettabits, that one. Um, that is all of known knowledge in a second. It's not a real, I mean, it's a real number, but it's not anything that anybody can reach. Um, 400 gig is pretty good, terabits insane. That's orders of magnitude bigger. So just watch, watch what we're doing, right? Like, why are we getting there? How did we get there? What numbers are we using? What traffic is it? What is the profile? You know, are we validating the use case? Are we actually testing the way that matters? Because I can build a test to make a box look awesome. I can also make a box, a, a test that will crush anything I pointed at because it's not real. So the smallest packets encrypted I can, as I can and break them up into, you know, fragmentation. And I will make boxes just like thermal out. <laughs> they, will, they will be very unhappy with me very quickly. 
That's all I got for this slide. <laughs> and this, that's where this goes to, right? You know, we talk about application mixes, and we talk about enterprise application control and MGFW. Well, you know, if vendor A and vendor B both claim application traffic mixes, but what does that mean? Are we talking SIP? SQL? HTTP? What? Um, often on data sheets, they don't give you enough data to be very clear about it. Whenever you look at third-party testing and, third, and that kind of stuff, they will tell you it is this percentage blah, it will, you know, it's this, it's this, and they will run that same traffic mix against all of the tested things. So you don't have vendor A claiming gigabit on app mix A, and you have vendor B claiming gig two gigabit on app mix B, when app mix A and B are completely different, and neither one of them real. <laughs> neither one of them are even close to what you actually experience in the real world. Um, so when, when you test these things, you need to ask these questions and understand where you're trying to deploy and what type of traffic you're expecting. Because if I get third party testing for a data center, right, is much different than, than the traffic profile you'll see in an NGFW. Most different you'll see in a WAF. Most different you'll see segmentation. Like, you hope you never see SMB go to the internet. Like, that's, that you, if you have a bad day, if you see SMB going to the internet. But, like, they will test that, and that's not a real, you hope that's not a realistic expectation. <laughs> also, turn that port off. <laughs> um, next slide, I think. And th that's where transparency comes, right? Like, you want to know, Ask the questions, know what you're looking for, make them give you the information because that's where the that's where the value really is, is to know what you're expecting. It's never gonna be one-to-one. -one. You're never gonna see exactly the same thing. Unless you give the test house a sample of your traffic, you can get really close then, but it's still gonna be simulated traffic, it's still gonna be from an ICSI or from a Spire, or from a test thing, which means it's gonna be simulated stats. But you get really close to reality, to what you expect. And that gives you room for scale. You'll know what you're up against with as your traffic increases. Because I don't think anybody here is expecting traffic to go down. Like I don't expect anybody who has their 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 you know their their forecast to have less traffic on their network. Um, I mean, aging myself, I remember modems <laughs> and T1s. And yeah, people and, picking up the phones. Yes, <laughs> exactly. People picking up the phones and making squealing noises at the phone. Anyway, so I mean, we look at gigabit to your house now. Right? I mean, that, that uh, two years ago, three years ago, was, it was absolutely insane. The problem with that is, as traffic increases, the number of requests increase, re increase, the threat vectors increase, because you can fit more bad stuff in the pipe now. You're being exposed to more and more. So you want that stuff to be protected. I mean, even at my house, like, just me. Like, I have an IPS. My kids love it. <laughs> Next slide. So, so you know, I'll set it up. So Tim, I mean, so, so Tim's laid out the traffic calls and, and really the pieces that go into building an environment that you can believe, as well as repeatedly execute to sure that the device or the technology that's in line will behave and perform to the level the organization's needs and that the experience for users is as invisible as possible, right? As an ideal security solution no one knows about. JJ mentioned it before. That's, that's that perfect scenario, that the experience is exemplary, but that it also protects against threats. And, and there's a lot of uh, techniques and tactics to go into this, so Tim, you know, if you could tease out you know, sort of what, uh, what goes into the design of a test as well as how a test house should think about and or what the data should reveal when, when somebody evaluates that data. So for, for looking at security, right, um, there are open source tools that you should use as your baseline test. I'm going to pull out Metasploit because these, they, they're known. Um, Metasploit's an easy thing to use. You can, there's a lot of other tools like that that you can use that will, uh, that will help you get there. But whenever you're looking at what bad guys are actually doing, you have basically two or three forms of thought. You have people that just blast the internet with the latest package bad thing, and they just, it's fishing. I mean, it's not fishing, but it's like fishing as in we're just going to send it to everybody and see who bites. Right? You have targeted attacks where they want your something and they're gonna actually do the work. It's really easy to block the, the, the broadband splash everything because set and hashes and stuff like this gets noticed. Like you just got ransomware. Um, you can block a lot of that stuff with good inspection. But you have to break some scriptures to do it. You have to you have to have the signatures and the hashes have to be active and valid for really weaponized threats. Um, in reality, I don't know who remembers this picture, by the way. <laughs> um, Hackers, the movie. 
Um, but the, really, whenever you look at it, you have to make sure that the thread, it actually can block threads. Packaging packets is only half the story. This is a product that's made to stop the bad guys from getting to you. Right? If you didn't want that, you could just buy a router and save a lot of money. You'd save a lot of time. But that's where security effectiveness comes into, right? You need to be able to look at the traffic, encrypted or not, and actually make decisions on it. You know, and make, and make sure your security profile matches what you have on your network. You know, like tune if you need to, tune if you can. You know, as much information, as much data as you can do will make you much more secure out there. Now, the next piece is really to ensure that again, you know, the data is both repeatable, it's, it's uh, referenceable, and that you can tell the story to a colleague or to others in your organization as to uh, you know, the guidance you're going to recommend or, or what selection's been made. Right, so, so the methodology is the how-to, the, the, the reference map or the legend, if you will, you know, looking at the compass on a map as to, you know, what tests are, are uh, executed and as well as you know, where, the, where the differences are. So if you could talk just a bit, Tim, and share with others, you know, how this comes together. So yeah, I mentioned RFC 2544. Um, it's, it's still the network basis, right? It's multiple sizes of GDP packets. It's basic packet processing routing, right? It's been around since before IPS. But it's a good lab test, right? To see how your packet processing, how your routing works, how all that stuff works, right? But it's never, it never was intended for real world. It was seriously to see how fast your chipset could go. Um, so it's just basic, but it's a good start, right? It, it's very well documented, it's very well known in the world of testing. In reality, you want to simulate what you got. You want to have VoIP traffic, you want to have SIP traffic, you want to have TLS traffic, you want to have all the things you will actually see in your environment. And that's where you want to simulate the traffic, your traffic, you're trying to simulate the use case where you're at. Because everybody's use case is different, right? If you have a firewall blocking all, you know, port 80, why are you testing it? Like, what, what are you doing? If you don't have IIS, why do you have that signature turned on? Like, what are you doing? So, the other thing is, whenever you're testing multiple products, any products, and I usually can put a, a, like analogy to this to a race car. You want the race to be the same race for all the cars. If I have one car that's a driver's car, and I put it on a NASCAR track, it's going to have a bad day. If I put it up against the NASCAR, it's going to have a much worse day. If I swap the conversation, I put a NASCAR on a drag strip, that top fuel drag strip is going to leave before he can shift gears, right? So you want to make sure that the config is the same. You're doing the same type of protection. You're doing the same configuration as much as possible between the different tested items, whatever they may be. So if you have app ID, if you have ID, IPS, IDS, all of the little features and knobs and twists and all the stuff that NGM has, make them as equitable as possible because that'll give you the most information when you're actually testing it. Um, when you do third party testing, the config should be as close to possible as the same across all tests and across all of the, the tested devices, right? You want the same traffic, you want, you know, the same attacks, the same number of attacks, the same frequency of attack, everything as close as possible. You'll never get to 100%, that's not reality, but you get as close as you can so you can get that, you reduce the variance, you reduce variables, you reduce variance on outcome. And as you reduce that, you get more and more information. You can, that information is more valuable to you as a customer because you can do better. What about threat recency? Uh, the age of the threat? Um, depends on your network. I would worry about new threats if you have stuff that is there and you want to make sure that you have threats that are valid. I mean, log for j Who saw that one coming? <laughs> Wasn't the, didn't that one start with Minecraft? I, I don't know. Yeah, it was a Minecraft exploit. Like somebody wrote it to mess with their Minecraft friends, and then it went the world wide. Like it went like weaponized and went all crazy. I didn't expect a lot for J attack. Like especially from where it came from. Every day there's new attacks. Every day there's new stuff. There was a new word uh, exploit a couple of days ago. Um, you think they patched that thing by now? <laughs> uh, every day there's a new attack. You want to make sure that whatever you're testing. You have the recent stuff. At the same time, right? If you have antiquated stuff, because you can't patch, you can't upgrade, the operational expense for upgrading your mail server, as an example, is too high, and you're running an old version of Microsoft Mail or whatever it is, you know, have them test those too, right? Because some of, like, the way that the signatures work, some of them, whenever they get old, they get kind of left behind, and they'll get disabled by default because they say this is five years old. And like, if you're still vulnerable, you still care. 
right? Like, you don't want that one signature, because one signature, if it's poorly written, can bring your whole box and make it have a bad day. The other thing is, is it's also, you know, advisable to make certain you understand the topology that we used, you know, in your own production or really in your own test scenario, right? It's always recommended to isolate and, and to, you know, uh, replicate real traffic put off to a segment that's, again, in a lab or in a controlled environment. It's as critical for any objective test to reflect what the topology was configured like for believability to understand how the depth of the stress the device under test here, uh, the technology assessed, but as well as that it's sort of representative of uh, you know, how traffic would flow in the, in the real world. So. So one of the things I want to say about this is this will surprise you when this guy fails, right? You send the package through, you have three points of failure, not one. So which one failed? Right? Did you kill the art table on your switch? Or was it this guy? How do you tell the difference? I mean, if you're monitoring all three, yeah. Like, you can sometimes tell the difference because this one stops talking to everybody and your SSH session drops. But, like, so then what do you do? Because you have stress tested this guy and not the one that you're actually going to buy. Right? So it's just something to think about, like, you want to make it match your topology, but you also want to simplify and make sure that you're watching for the right mode of failure. Right? Because if this guy dies before this guy dies, you'll never see what that one can actually do, right? And that's just something you have to watch out for because it will bite, it will, it will bite you and you'll spend a lot of time troubleshooting. Tim speaking from experience, <laughs> having broken every appliance in our test lab. Not including just the one under test. So, it really, I mean, to, to sum this all up, right? We recognize that, that testing every technology you're considering to be able to green yourself, it's, it's complex. It is an enormous amount of work. Right? I often engaged in, in you know, year-long uh, single technology consulting projects for very large organizations because the, the depth and, and the scope of their test needs was so extensive. But being able to leverage excellent um, material from third-party firms uh, such as CyberRays, uh, is such as ICSA Lab. So there's, there's groups that do have excellent data sets that you can leverage to reduce the effort you need to take on yourself to test through it. But it's crucial that you have the measurement detail you know, and that you understand the results. Right? There, there's no room for guessing in the world of cyber. I, I get, you know, and it's, and it's always one of those, you know, it just makes me kind of kind of nervous and, and, and cringe when I hear your data sheets look good. And are meant to, but there are you know vendors you know, like Juniper Networks that we, we pride ourselves on our transparency and all the results or all the traffic mixes that, for example, Tim talked about earlier are noted in every individual data sheet. So you've got clear text as to how those numbers were achieved, and then you can you know again gauge for yourself whether they're the right mix for you. But knowing exactly how the numbers on the data sheet are achieved is also part of that great count, and that's why being able to compare objectively between vendors via a third-party test organization uh, is incredibly valuable. But they're only going to get you again so far. So every environment you do, use this to augment and to really uh, supplement your own efforts so that you've got a better gauge. Um, and again, like I said, the more transparent those test organizations are, uh, and of course, you know, MITRE's doing endpoint, pretty extensive endpoint testing. There, there are groups that do this. Knowing how they arrived at the results that they did will help you understand whether their test environment was something that you can translate into your own use. It saves you, you know, an unbelievable amount of time. It would often shave off, uh, again, you know, three to nine months on most of the projects that, that I used to engage on for this effort. And, and you know, at the end of the day, uh, it's not just that it saves incredible time, it also provides peace of mind. Because at the end of the day, security is all about trust. Both, you know, trust in the products, trust, trust in the technology, trust in the vendors. That they're doing that constant work of updating their appliance or their technology. Because it's not a one and done. It would be awesome if this was set and forget technology. But let's face it, the actors aren't just sitting there with the, okay, well, this was the last exploit I've written, I'm good. So, those signatures, uh, the discovery here is, so all the technologies that go into identifying accurately the threats um, must be, you know, 
a, a part of this purchase decision or, or this acquisition and, and understand that, you know, how those results are, are executed and executed over time uh, is also valuable, right? And uh, you know, really, you know, the testing, again, saves folks you know, potentially you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. And it's, it's one of those things that I'll constantly you know, champion. I'm very passionate about you know, organizations making choices based on data, on fact, and knowing what those products will do in deployment as opposed to relying on data sheets that potentially have data or on just really stretched truths that is all too often the case uh, in, in, in this space. So uh, again, Tim and I did this for quite a while before we joined Juniper. Uh, have an enormous amount of experience in it, and uh, yeah, third-party testing is an invaluable resource for every organization in order to help them select the right technology for their needs. So, uh, with that, Tim, uh, I don't know if you, you know, want to touch on this real quick. But. So, uh, this is our our recent security effectiveness. So, uh, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am all about the security. I'm, I, performance is cool and all, packet processing. I want to see who can stop the bad guys. Um, I'm pretty rough about that, as Kate knows. Um, we're doing well. Um, I'm not done, but we're doing well. I don't think I'll ever be done. This reason I joined security. Uh, you know, uh, we have you know NSS, which is now cyber. Uh, we did well in the data center. That was a pretty you know extensive test. Um, we have a double A certification with cyber ratings. Um, NetSec Open, for those who don't know, is an open source uh, testing uh, architecture that is being built um, with a lot of people built into it. Um, it's a lot of vendor-driven testers. Uh, the testing house like XP Inspire are also parts of it. Um, and they're making an RFC for testing of NGFW specifically so that everybody can test. That's the whole idea, is that you can, anybody should be able to run this you know, and get results out of it. Um, NetSec Open is actually not tested by that organization. It's tested by third-party testing houses, and they certify the results. So there's not even like, I couldn't influence those results if I wanted to. It's another group of people out there. Um, and then we have ICSA Labs that um, we keep doing really well with. Uh, and uh, you know, it, it's like I said, I'm, I don't think security's ever done. You know, it's like every year, every day, every minute, something new comes out. And the fact that we can keep doing this over and over again shows that we're investing in the security, we're trying to make a secure product, we're trying to improve, right? Because it's never, we're never done. Like, I'm never gonna be done. I don't think I'm retired, ever. <laughs> no, security is a job that'll go long past our career levels. So one thing of interest in particular is that the ICSA test, as I mentioned before, right, transparency, clarity, what are they doing? Uh, they do a great job on, for example, false positives, right? The bane of, of most ops teams and frankly their headaches waiting because obviously chasing false alerts that distract you from the rest of the job, in particular, right, the real legitimate threats, uh, it, it is a nightmare for every team. And so uh, we've, we've achieved awesome results, Tim, we'll touch on that in a second, but uh, specifically this test is composed of the threats that are actually um, what support and are part of the Verizon data, you know, the, the, the big DBIR, right, so the, the annualized uh, the breach report that, that, that Verizon writes, and ICSA Labs is a sub-entity of Verizon, uh, is, is what feeds the threats, and so these threats are run through this technology uh, within 24 hours of receipt, so they are very, very new, and they really challenge the technologies deployed. But Tim, that so piece... False, false positives are, are soapbox I can get on, and, and Mike knows this. Um, okay, for so, those of you who don't know what a false, false positive is, I'm sorry, I tend to talk fast, um, it is whenever you block something non-malicious, right? So you block your CEO's email, right? You killed the web server because it started blocking all of the incoming traffic because someone changed the website and didn't let you know, right? All of a sudden, Amazon goes away. Uh, they are the most expensive thing. A breach can be bad. The next point getting through your thing can be bad. But you blocking the legitimate traffic that your company needs can be just as bad, right? Um, so whenever we look at false positives, and I see say, like you said, test them pretty well, we, get, we don't block bad things. We don't, we, we don't block things that are not supposed to be blocked, to be more accurate, right? Um, you want the bad traffic blocked, you want the good traffic to pass by. And that is where the, the strength of the security effectiveness comes in, right? You only want to block the bad guys. So if you like think of it like as a police officer at the gate here, like I'm blocking all guys wearing sunglasses. Well, that's not a realistic, you know, expectation, right? Um, but if you have a, a very pre precise description of a threat, and you're like, okay, you know, six foot one, his name is Tim, you know, he's wearing a kilt. 
like, okay, well, you probably got a good chance of catching the right guy. Um, so that's where false positives really come into play. It's like, you don't want to block stuff that's, in the, that's, that's co company impacting you, but you want to stop all the bad guys from getting at the same time. And balancing that, the threat versus the impact on the network, the negative impact on the network, is where you really want to watch yourself. Because security is only as good as the product. If you go to a company and you have a lot of false positives, their answer, in my experience, is that A, they turn off the security, they pull the box out of line, and then they call the company they bought it from and they're like, you blocked my CEO's email. <laughs> and that is not a good conversation. I did support for a long time. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the fact that we do very good at false positives is also like, it just shows that we are trying to make sure that the bad guys get stopped, the good guys, you know, do what you're supposed to do, keep business rolling. Right, and so, you know, so you're going to touch on, you know, specifically the data center, right? So, yeah, just folks, there's results in all these tests available for you to review. And, uh, you know, as you can see, as I built the slide, right? Uh, so, uh, so these are not our results. This is Netflix Open. Um, these are all published on the internet. You can go to the website and look if you want to. I just pulled the numbers out. Um, and, yeah, so we did this first time. We missed some exploits. And I was like, well, that's not cool. <laughs> so, uh, we went back and worked with the engineering and we found out that we had some signatures that were there, they just didn't fire, right? And so, uh, and some of them weren't turned on, I think one of them wasn't even turned on in the default profile. So, so we turned the signatures on, we fixed the ones that were broken, we added to it, we fixed it, and we went back. Here, we missed one, one exploit. You know, I, we still have things to do, but we're still growing, we're still, we're still improving, we're ever, ever improving. Um, you can see the other ones. I'm not going to beat up on the guys because it's on the screen. Um, again, here, you know, 4,600, 99.5% effective. This set of, uh, of exploits is huge. It's a lot of bad traffic. This one's a little bit smaller, but this one's huge. That's a lot of numbers. What is it? 2,300 exploits, I think? Yeah, I don't recall, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a sizable amount. It's not like, you know. Um, but as you can see, we're, we're constantly trying to work on, you know, making the product more secure. Speed is cool, you know, I like speed, packets, pet, all are cool, but like stopping the bad guys were... But it's gotta be fast while doing the job it's supposed to. It has to do the work. So. Exactly. All right, well, folks, I mean, clearly, you know, we've ran through a, a great deal of material in here, right? There's there's reference links um, that we can certainly point you to this as well, uh, both on our website as well as, you know, on the respective organizations, uh, you know, locations, right? The, the data is robust, and again, you know, having that confidence, having the ability to look at a third-party test and, and look through, you know, uh, how it's configured, be able to scrutinize what's in there and how well it matches your own environments that you can best understand, uh, you know, and how the test is executed, how the vendors fare, and how repeatable it is. When you get challenged about why did you choose X or why did you choose Y, then you've got, you know, quite a bit of ammunition in your pocket to pull out and, of course, support the choice so that, you know, you can, you can defend the organization's choice to pursue that and really to, to, to you know, deliver it. And, and of course, you know, if you want to talk more about how to, you know, run proof of concepts or test yourselves, if that's your, if that's your shtick, then, you know, Tim, Tim's done this for decades, so uh, we'd happily, happily talk further. So, any questions uh, with that? And uh, perhaps a slide, so. Perfect time. You made it at the very end. We <laughs> were like, you know, like, oh, it sounds like he's just starting. Let's sit down and listen. And then you're like, any questions? He's not just starting. <laughs> what was it? What did I miss? All of this. Go back one slide. They want to take pictures. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, do you know you can just like pick me up in the deck? <laughs> Uh, this was third-party testing and why data sheets are not always truthful. Okay. And so uh, I think this is going to be, you have to ask her when, when it's going to be available. I have no idea. We love to get out of this stuff, so okay. that's the chat for this. All right, well, thank you, everybody. I uh, certainly appreciate the time.